ready to rock in Houdini. So I was thinking I might start off by trying to finish the lava lamp. I have some ideas about some other cool things that I can try in Flip to try and make it feel a bit more lava lampy. I don't have my, my reference today, but um, that's okay. I think I, I think I know what to do. Hey, Mahmood. I think I pronounced that right. How's it going? Thanks for joining me. Um, so yeah, I, I thought we'd just we'd just start off with that, and then um, we can you know we can take from there. If anyone has any questions or anything that you know interested in learning about, then feel free to um you know ask questions while I'm going through as well. I mean these aren't really designed to be tutorials necessarily, but um, I'm happy to yeah I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has any questions. So this is, I just wrote the sim out and it kind of has changed a little bit from what I, oops, you know, you can't see me. Um, it's changed a little bit from what I had last week. I, I was fiddling around with it and I think I, I sort of messed it up a little bit. The thing that bothers me about it is that it's not, not super blobby, like it's a bit kind of stringy and it's all joined together. So I really want to see if I can create those more circular blobs and also get separation between, you know, between blobs. So it's not just this one big mass. Uh, one of the, you know, I, I sort of tried it down here uh, last week where I had these individual spheres and I thought I could try that again and try some, some other stuff as well. Um, but then I also started investigating this surf, how, like how how the foot solver controls surface tension. So if you have a look at the flip solver surface tension here, if you oh, I can't remember where it was. I uh, I think I was looking at the help for for the flip solver. I don't know if I have it here. Let's see. No. Um, oh, there's a render. So there's a redshift render that uh, I popped out. And I, I, you'll notice as well, I modeled the rest of the lava lamp so just so we can get a complete picture. Um, but yeah, I was looking at the help for the flip solver and I saw that the surface tension, if I try to find it, surface tension here says it creates a surface pressure field. Uh, this field can be used for other effects than just surface tension, such as suction or avoidance. So avoidance is the thing that interests me. So a kind of way to separate groups of particles, maybe. Um, so I was thinking maybe I could try and do something with that and see if, if I can get blobs to separate. So the way that, you know, I would start off by doing something like that is trying to see what the surface pressure field looks like. And I don't have, um, I've got this pressure field here. I'm not sure if it's, I think it's, it's slightly different to the pressure field. So if you have a look at this, we turn off the particles and we have a look at what that's giving us. You can see we've got, I don't know what values they are, but if you have a look, we're doing a two tone mapping. Let's do infrared. So we can see the high pressure value here and then it's sort of low low pressure it looks like here out here but that that probably needs to go even lower because that really should be uh actually looks like negative pressure so it must be negative inside uh and it must be negative outside too or, or maybe it's positive inside I don't, i'm not sure the way that we can check that is to go outside and it becomes a little bit clearer um but i don't think this is the field that i want anyway because it's just called pressure field so what I did, I was just doing this earlier, just to, just to, just to sort of see. I've got a dop import here, and this is where you usually bring out your fields for flip. Hey, John. Hey, Rushback. How's it going? Thanks for joining me. Um, so you can see, these, this is where you usually. So if I put down a, another dop import fields, you put the dop network up here. So slash, slash. Oops, dop net. And the dot node is basically the path to the dot net. And then flip, flip object. 
and then you choose a preset so you would choose like flip fluid and you can see it brings geometry velocity uh, surface and velocity so geometry is the points surface and vel are two fields but then i want to look at that surface pressure field so we can just basically add an extra field here and type in the correct field so surface pressure and then we can see it so that's what it looks like and if we put a volume slice up to it and choose the correct field up here then we can create an attribute on this slice to visualize this information so uh, i'm not going to import the geometry at surface or the vel just surface pressure here and i can also visualize it and see it as a plane so i can see that that surface pressure is high around where the points are i'm going to look at this one let's turn the geometry on so you can see that the surface pressure is kind of high either side of the surface, the outside surface of this fluid, and then it falls off on the inside and it falls off on the outside. And we can actually see what those values are as well by looking at the spreadsheet. Whatever you put in here will get mapped to the spreadsheet so we can actually see that there are values of a thousand, which is quite high. Um, so we should probably change our range here. <coughs> uh, I haven't been going that long John, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't show up straight away in YouTube, I've noticed. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Only only about 10 minutes, but but the first five or so minutes, I, you couldn't hear me anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, you, haven't missed, you haven't missed much. Um, modeling in Maya. What are you, uh, what are you modeling, Rushback? Yeah. Um, <laughs> We had some slight deafness issues, Audrey, that's right. Um, but thankfully, I managed to managed to figure it out. Um, so if I adjust my visualization range to a thousand and a thousand, we can see we get a better kind of infrared cross section. So let's try and we'll pull this back down. Let's pull this down to a hundred. So the red, so the way that the infrared visualizer works is it's blue is the lowest end. Um, and red is the highest end. So anything that is blue here would be that negative 1,000 value, and anything that's approaching red will be that positive 1,000 value. So you can see, as you bring that down, you can sort of you can see it a bit differently. And you can also map these values to these points on the slice, and that, that makes it even clearer. So if I put surface pressure on here, I'll then be able to see what those values are. So let's have a look. So we can see here, oh, these ones are all zero. Well, that's cool. And then it's a little bit hard to see. You know what would make this easier? If I just um, put an attribute angle down here and say at surface pressure equals int at surface pressure. Let's see if this works. Ah, look at that. <coughs> um, Broom of Harry Potter. Oh, cool. Sounds good. What's the game plan? Well, so today I'm just looking at the lava um, sim from last week. Just trying to, trying to get it a bit more blobby and to get individual blobs to separate from each other. I think that's the main thing that I want to look at. So... I'm investigating this surface pressure field, which is created by the surface tension checkbox. You would turn that on, it gets created. So I just want to see if I can use this or maybe make my own surface pressure field um, based on groups of blobs or something. I, I don't really know. Yeah, this value is, is per voxel. So Flipworks is like a, a hybrid solver. So it has both points and, vol and volumes and the surface pressure is a volume. So this is the resolution of that field, each each one of these squares represents basically the size of those three-dimensional voxels. So by rounding this value to an integer, I can now see it a little clearer. You know, it's really hard to kind of, you have to zoom in quite far to see all these decimals. So if I just round it, that makes it a lot easier. And I can see that the areas probably right on the surface or right where the Right where the points are, are probably going to be the highest. There's a few little outliers out there, but I think that's what's going on. Uh, it's kind of hard to 
kind of hard to tell exactly, but so we've got some we've got some crazy negative values. It looks like there's negative values right on the edge of this here, and then positive. Yeah, it's a bit all over the place. It's a bit all over the place. They're very high values as well. It's not not really what I expected, but I think uh, I was also reading it is related to um, density as well. So it may it may get multiplied. You know, this value is only set to twenty. It may get multiplied up uh, based on the density. So you know, it does change based on density. Um, so what I'm thinking is that perhaps I can use this field bring it into a SOP solver and modify it or make my own version of it. Um, so we've got our SOP solver here, pulling in our points and affecting them, affecting the, creating our like random heat value, temperature values, stuff like that. Um, so I'm gonna create another SOP solver here. And instead of bringing in geometry here, I'm gonna just put surface pressure. So the way that you figure out what data type to bring into these SOP solvers is by having a look at the geometry spreadsheet. You see over here on the sort of tree view that you get with dots, there's different, under the flip object, there's different sort of objects, I guess. And each one, you know, inside it has its own stuff. So here's the geometry one. If you click on that, you can see all the point attributes. But down, if I keep going down, and I can't actually see surface pressure here at the moment. I've got surface and some other stuff. If I step forward one, I start to get a few more things showing up. So let's keep, oh, step forward. There we go. There, surface pressure shows up because it doesn't actually get calculated until the first frame. So you have to hit play or go forward one for it to show up in, in all of the data. So there's our surface pressure field. And you can see it's in the same kind of line as geometry. So it's another thing that we can bring in. So it's surface pressure, let's bring that in and see what, what we get with that. So surface pressure. And what I would hope to see, instead of when I bring in geometry, what I get from this stop import is points coming in. Let me go back. Sometimes they, these don't update quite correctly. Let me just uh, make my background gray. So there we go, there's my points coming in there. Let's have a look in here. If I step forward one frame, out here, step forward, have a look in here. Let's see what we've got. We've got nothing at the moment. Step forward a few more. Make sure that we've got surface tension turned on, we do. Make sure we've spelt this correctly, surface pressure. So just go through, wait for it to solve a little bit and then go inside and see. Oh, there we go. So you can see at the first frame it doesn't show up and then afterwards, so we can see this field. So we could do our same volume slicing here as well. So just just so that we can visualize in SOPs, in SOPs inside the DOP network, we can, we can visualize this stuff as well. So here we go, we're seeing similar values. So what am I thinking? What am I thinking? Um, I'm wondering if I can create this field myself and if maybe, maybe out here, like I generate some, some groups, like even if I use this kind of idea to generate my blobs, my initial blobs, or perhaps I create some groups based on spheres like this, where I just, you know, create a group, maybe create a sphere like this. That's going to be way too big. Okay, group, bounding regions, bounding object, uh, point group, there we go. So let's take this down and move this, move this sphere up. And that then will create me a group like that. So let's call this blob one. And maybe I'll do another one. Call this blob two. So let's say we've got two blobs. They may, may, I want to make sure that they're not intersecting. So let's just check out spheres here. 
They may be intersecting slightly. I might just move this one down a little bit. So there we go. We've got blob 1 and blob 2. Uh, now, we could give those different values as well if we wanted to, but what I'm thinking is that perhaps I can sort of work out how this surface pressure field is being created, and I'll need to go inside the flip solver to find that out. Allow it in with contents. Go and find the surface pressure calculation. So let's have a look. We've got solve here. So let's find anything that might be called surface pressure. Here's surface weights, viscosity, pressure solve. So let's see if we can find the surface pressure here. Viscosity pressure. And you can, you know, you can of course use uh, a find function to find this stuff, but you know, sometimes I find it's just useful to look through this stuff in case you see something that you're like, oh, that might be, that might be useful. Um, so this is all to do with advection of the particles, which is going to take the velocity field and move the particles. But then, so all this stuff is to do with moving the actual, um, the actual velocity field and calculating the pressure and all that stuff. Ah, here's match surface pressure. So, ah, okay. So what is going on here is it's just basically copying the surface field and putting that into surface pressure. So that's, that's all surface pressure is doing. Um, so perhaps then we should go and look at how the surface field is being created. So we've got this gas particle to SDF. So I think that's probably, that's creating the surface index. And then here, gas, gas reinitialize SDF. That looks like what is creating the surface field maybe, or updating the surface field. It looks like there's a whole bunch of stuff for creating the surface field. So this one, gas particle to SDF. Uh, that one looks like it has to do with the droplet creation as well. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's just a group if droplets are enabled to bring that to be part of it. Um, let's see if there's any other surface stuff here. No, it doesn't look like it. It's a crazy amount of stuff in here. But, you know, it's really good to, to look through um, solvers like this and try and try and learn, you know, what is going on. Um, rush back, kind of overwhelmed by Houdini. Yeah, look, that's that's natural. You know, it's overwhelming amount of stuff that you can do in Houdini. Um, but I think it's just, you know, you just got to start small. You know, find find something that, that's useful to you about it. You know, when I started using Houdini, I just used it for fluid sims. And, and then I got out. You know, I just exported the thing that I needed and and got out of there because it was too, you know, it was too overwhelming to try and learn the whole thing all at once. Um, so I think, you know, just just attack it bit by bit. And, oh, well, that's, that's cool. Grooming, you know, grooming is a challenging thing that not everyone can do as well. So, um, yeah, I look, I think, I think that's a good place to start. If you, you know, if you have a use for grooming, then you will get exposed to, um, you know, to all the kind of, to the ways that you can kind of do things in Houdini. The more you get into it, the more complex you can, you can treat that, you know, that groom um, with attributes and things like that. So I think that's a fine place to start. And then you just kind of attack it bit by bit, but you don't have to learn every kind of aspect of Houdini. Just, you know, just learn the parts that suit you. Um, <laughs> it's just like magic. Yeah, look, I mean, sometimes I wish, you know, VFX was a little bit more straightforward, but it's kind of, you know, having having the ability to kind of do anything you like and be able to kind of dive inside and mess with things. This is like, you know, kind of if you don't like the way that something like that a filter is working in Photoshop, you can kind of crack it open and go and mess with it. Um, but with with that 
becomes, you know, a lot of problems that you can create for yourself. You can break things very easily and, you know, it's sort of, um, it's, it's very easy to mess things up in Houdini because you can kind of create anything and edit anything. Um, sometimes you'll come across stuff that you can't edit in Houdini and you're like, oh man, I really wish I could, really wish I could mess with that. But then you maybe create your own tool. Um, but for, for VFX, you know, and creating complex effects, it's, it is kind of, it is the really, you know, the best thing out there. Um, and, and everyone says, you know, what about, what about Blender or what about Maya and what about, you know, all these sort of things, but they just don't have the, the minute control that, uh, that we need to do these very specific, very specific things. <laughs> Hey Sean, how's it going? Welcome. That's right. Nothing, nothing more satisfying than seeing a node tree being built. Um, grooming is uh, is like fur, uh, Audrey. So like when you have a character with hair or fur, um, grooming is is like basically setting that up. You know, combing it as well. So you know. Um, growing the hairs, making them the correct length and then brushing them or, you know, putting them in the correct direction. Um, John says, definitely a lot to remember. However, it's pretty cool having the ability to go backwards, dive inside a node. Yeah, that, that's right. See how, you know, see how they originally built stuff and, and, and learn from it. And that's how I, you know, that's how I learn about all this stuff and you can see I'm doing it here trying to figure out what you know what they were doing um so I think what I I can't inside SOPs I can't use this gas particle to SDF I do have the ability to grab the surface but I kind of want to generate that surface based on those groups that I just created so what I'm going to do inside of here this is the cool thing about SOP solvers as well is I actually want to bring in my points too so I'm just going to put down another dop import here and I'm just going to grab the dop network, which is, if I just go out a few type dop network and then fetch geometry, there's my points. So now I've got my points and I've got my surface pressure field. So from here, I could do VDB from particles, create an SDF. So this is going to, now this is the weird thing about um, SOP solvers is you can't really play inside them. So you have to go out, play for a few frames and then have a look inside here. So this is giving an error. It's probably due to the minimum radius here. So there we go, take that down. I'll set that to one, just leave that take my voxel scale this voxel size should probably be related to this flip particle separation so I'm just going to copy that and paste that value there paste value paste relative reference there we go so that now has given me a kind of surface field so we've got like this band basically of fluid and we can turn on uh, I think uh, we don't have the ability to fill interior with this one, but that should be all right. Um, surface. Okay. So there are surface. And then, so I think what's going on inside the sop solver, inside the flip solver, what we saw, what I saw over there somewhere, I can't remember where it was now, um, was that it was copying that pressure field from, I think maybe it was down, oh wait, there's a gas match field somewhere. Probably should have, sometimes I color them so that I can find them again, because it, um, it is quite hard to, to find them in this big, big mess. Um, there, surface pressure, so let me color that red. So here we're just, basically, gas match field is just turning one field into another. It's taking the data and the size and the resolution of the surface field and turning it into a field called surface pressure. So if we go out to our slop solver, we can basically turn that into a fog because it looks like 
It looks like that's what the surface pressure is. It's a fog field here. But it looks like we need to grow it as well, because it's quite a bit broader than this. So perhaps I'll make the point radius scale larger. And I wonder if that will give us a similar result. This also looks a bit lower resolution. Let's have a look at the voxel size is actually two times. And so what's going on there, if you have a look uh, back at the flip solver, we've got this grid scale of two. So it's, it's actually, that's that's relationship to the, the voxels. So it's actually two times the particle separation. So we should copy that parameter and whoops, in our sub solver under the VDV particle resolution, I'm going to here put times and paste that grid scale and then we'll get the same resolution. And that looks pretty good. About to sleep. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so there we go. That, that's kind of looking pretty close. So it's the, the radius scale is five. I don't know what that kind of relates to, but um, I'll just do it by eye for now. But so what I'm thinking here is that I'm going to put in a group. Oh, sorry, like a, maybe I'll put a split in. <laughs> Thanks, Audrey. Um, so, yeah, see that? How I've been able to isolate, I've isolated that little group there, that blob one. It actually looks blobby, which is cool, because I guess it's squashing with all the other particles. If I do a VDB from that, then I've got a volume just around that blob. And if I copy this one here, and actually not on that split. I'm going to, maybe I'll put a different split down and set it to blob two. Then this one has, it's, it's hard to see with this gray, but this one has a VDB as well on it. So now I've got these two distinct blobs of density and I can call them surface pressure like this, surface pressure. I have no idea if this is going to work, to be honest, but you know, it's, it's worth a shot. Um, I'm sure it'll do something. I just don't know whether, you know, it might just explode. I have no idea. So well, that's, that's the fun. That's the fun of it. You've got to try these things. So I'm going to set this to, uh, I guess, just like add or let's try maximum. Yeah, add, add will produce some weird results in the junction there because the, those values will accumulate. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, John. I, I, I mean, I really like, you know, this stuff messing around with these base kind of um, behaviors of, of the solver and trying to get something different or to force a behavior that you, you're trying to get. And I do all this stuff with Pyro all the time. Just trying to, trying to really, you know, push what you can do with this stuff and get very custom and, and, and specific behaviors. So there we can see we've got very specific blobs. And as we go back to the start, you know, they're, maybe they're too close together, these things, I don't know. Um, but so we've got this field now and I've combined them back together using a VDB combine and I've set it to maximum and maximum will just, will just keep that max value at the same instead of adding them, which will end up pushing those values higher. Max will just keep that max value like a clamp so let's let's just take a look at these values because we need to kind of end up with if we go back out and see what our surface pressure was doing previously we need to kind of end up with these values right like these these thousand values we've got thousand and negative thousand here yeah well that that's right john um and and people build like surface pressure you know types of surface pressure all the time. Different. Di there's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, what's difficult about this one is, yeah, we're trying to keep two blobs distinct and separate and, and try to stop them from joining together. Um, having those groups will also help in, in um, meshing as well. I can mesh them separately and that, that will really help as well. So we've got these negative thousand and thousand values, but in here, if I was to volume slice this one, We've got, you know, let's have a look at the spreadsheet. We've got between zero and zero. No, so we've got between, yeah, we've got zero to one essentially because density 
it's a scalar value and it's just going to give us it's going to give us zero one it doesn't do negatives surface does do negative values so maybe maybe we should use surface first because surface gives basically a direction inside and outside of that surface so let's let's call the surface field surface pressure like that and let's see if that gives us some better results so we'll combine those two volume slice uh, see so now we've got negative values so we've got negative values and positive values but they're super low so we can in a uh, let's say a volume wrangle just crank those up so let's do at surface pressure times equals 1000 why not just for fun Uh, yes, yes, that's a good uh, that's a good idea, John. It is possible to well, it should be possible to do that. We would perhaps need to bring in well, we've got the points coming in here. We may just need to uh, yeah drive that value maybe. Um, yeah, we can we can try it. We can try it out. So let's have a look. Now we're getting you can see this multiplication happening. This thousand multiplication is raising those values from 0.06 to 60. So we're not getting massive values still. We might need to go a little more. 10,000. Go crazy with it. So we've got minus 500 and 600 there. So that's interesting. Um, so let's let's have a look at this field, make sure. So it's, oh, interesting. Okay, so let's set this to SDF. Because it's an SDF now, the you can't really use the same functions that you could with um, with the density. So SDF union is probably a good one, just a merging of those two SDFs. SDF intersection will give you that and the difference will kind of give you a subtraction. So let's try union. And then if, I don't know if it will use it like this as an SDF or whether we need to convert it. So I'm guessing it probably needs to be a fog volume. So I'm just going to convert it the type from SDF to fog and check those values again because that might get rid of those negative values it probably has let's have a look functional spreadsheet yeah it converts it back to positive values so maybe I won't do that let's let's leave it off and see it may even just be the the way that it's being displayed as a fog volume so we could try using a primitive node under volumes, adjust visualization, set it to smoke. Maybe that's all that's going on there and it is actually an SDF field. Um, so yeah, I don't know, let's see. <laughs> SDF, SDF. Uh, SDF in French is a homeless person. Um, SDF stands for signed distance field. So it, it gives you a distance. So you can see here, it's called distance VDD. Um, so it, it gives you a distance, positive values are outside the surface and negative values are inside the surface. Whereas a fog volume just gives you zero or one values. Is there fog? Yes, one, no fog, no, zero. So, um, so yeah, and, and you can see, but I can change the way that it displays by adjusting the visualization so you can see iso surface will display like that and smoke oh rainbow rainbow's nice um so yeah you know we can we can change that stuff so this is outputting now surface pressure i, I really don't know what's going to happen when i play this so i'm going to hit save because <laughs> could be could be catastrophic we've got two things fighting here as well creating surface pressure so um i don't know if if perhaps I should turn this off and see if it still works or, or leave it on and hope for the best. Let's, let's hope for the best. Um, <laughs> save, save, save. Um, hopefully it doesn't tank my machine, but it should, should be okay. Let's see, see if anything happens. Nothing exciting is happening yet. Let's check our fields. So we've got, we've got our fields here. There may be more to this as well. We may need to do 
<laughs> we may need to do more. This may be very underwhelming. We may just do nothing. Um, because there may be more to it. Or what's happening in the solver might be stamping over what I'm doing here. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll let it run for a little bit. This is a long scene. It takes a while for it to kind of show the results of what's going on. Um, and, you know, we probably need to do a comparison as well where we look at what happened before this, this sob solver was turned on and what happens, you know, when it is turned on and see if there's a difference. It looks like nothing is happening. So maybe it's doing something. Um, maybe the pressure values are too high or something. So let's, let's turn this off and just get a, some sort of baseline. In fact, let me just check my sob solver here. You know why? That's why, because my view flag is uh, not in the right place. So let's just, let's get a baseline. See, see what we get just without, without our crazy swap solver. So this should be heating up now. And um, if, if you didn't see this, go back and have a look at last week's, um, last week's video. I think it's, they've been renamed now, so you can't go by the number anymore. Um, but it's, I think it's just called lava lamp or something. Um, and you can see how I did the, the heating effect. Um, and it takes quite a while to get going, just like a real lava lamp. But hopefully it'll rise up a little bit. I think I, I definitely kind of messed with it a bit. So I might have to go back um, to my one of my older files and, and see, you know, what, what settings I changed because it is working a little bit differently. I think I was messing around with like the stickiness of the surface as well. But you can see it's it's starting to get up into the top section now where it's going blue and that is going to force it to cool and drop down. Yeah, it's it's not too bad this this version. I actually made the source a bit bigger as well, which which seems to have helped. Um So you can see the blue stuff is starting to come down now and we've still got those groups as well so if you have a look coming out of here we've got blob one and blob two so this is you know even without that sop solver on there we can isolate those blobs and yeah it's interesting they're actually really spreading out and not being a blob anymore so that's what i want to try and you know stop i want to i want it to stay a blob and stay together. So then we've got that blob one. Let's have a look at blob two. Blob two is kind of really getting spread out as well. But what what we could do with these when we come to meshing, we'll go back to the the solver in a second. But I just want to show you this. When I mesh these two blobs, if I mesh them separately and then merge them back together, they won't be blended together so they will be kind of set and they kind of lie over the top of each other but you can see if i just adjust the um maybe the droplet scale a little bit you can see they actually are separate meshes so when you come to render that will be good for separation so that they actually look like two different surfaces now at the moment it's not working because they're kind of they're they're occupying a very similar space but you can see here when they're right next to each other, they're not blending to each other. So they're staying as separate blobs. Oh, there we go. That, that looks pretty cool. But because they end up stretching kind of through each other, it sort of breaks a little bit. So let's get our surface, try and, try and work out our surface tension. So we'll turn this on now and see, see what happens. Um, Yeah, I don't know. The other exciting development from last week is that I now have 128 gig of RAM. Woohoo! So uh, I can run these sims at, at a much higher resolution, which is which is great. And also I can have a much larger cache in my viewport, which, um, which is really handy. Hopefully it means that my computer doesn't crash so often as well. Um, but this, this will allow me to really push, push some of these effects 
a lot a lot harder um yeah celebration that's right i only had 32 before um which is kind of okay but you know it definitely it definitely restricts you somewhat um in in the fidelity and the the resolution that you can you can get with certain things i sort of developed ways of dealing with it um but yeah it's it's obviously better if you have more it's easier you don't have to worry about about those things so much um so it's interesting things going on here with this with this turned on it's definitely there's definitely surface tension happening you know it's it's a lot kind of smoother and together but we're still not getting those distinct blobs i think you know one of the things that we're we're gonna find difficult because of viscosity is that you know viscosity is blurring the velocity field across the whole thing so high viscosity is going to give you a very blurred and together result where, where the particles are going to all kind of stick together because you just have this very blurry field that's affecting them all so if you imagine like if the velocity field wasn't blurred particles can kind of splash about and be free you know to to be individual but um but if the velocity field is blurred you know one particle that was moving like this now becomes five or ten particles that are all moving in the same direction together so it becomes very hard to separate things when you're dealing with viscosity um there's some interesting things going on here though so I don't know, well it's definitely something is working um we need to do some more comparisons, I guess, just to check. And let's color these two blobs and see. Um, Rizwan says, can you model Luxo Jr. from the Pixar logo? Uh, I mean, I probably could, Rizwan, but I'm not really a modeler. So, um, you know, it's not not my forte to, to do modeling. That, that's for sure. Um, I don't think, you know, uh, we can we can have a look at, at Luxo and, and I, can, I can sort of uh, give you my ideas about how how you could model that in houdini but yeah i mean it's not not an overly complex um design so it wouldn't be too hard to model uh you know with modeling anything you just approach it kind of piece by piece if you break it down and look at all the individual pieces of the luxo model um i don't think you know i don't think it would be overly complicated um so yeah, I mean, there's some interesting things going on now. We're not getting such a mix of those two fluids. Although, let me just um, let me just look at the points because the fluid itself isn't isn't super. Um, the mesh itself isn't super good at the moment. Let's have a look at these two. See how they see how they're behaving. Yeah, so they are still kind of mixing a little bit, which is, which is not great. I wonder, you know, John, you mentioned last week that, that maybe we should try this with density and maybe we would have better results if we were kind of giving blobs different densities because that might help with mixing uh, or, or stopping them from mixing. Um, I don't know. Perhaps it's just that I have one blob going through the other, like one blob at the bottom going through the green one maybe i should maybe i should try having them sort of separate instead so that they're you know one is not rising through the other they're just kind of more um what am i moving here this one they're more just sort of side by side and that might might kind of help as well let's try that don't want to create too much work for ourselves let's see we go this might might make it easier i can up because of my because of my exp expanded ram now i can up my cache memory so that i can get more in my viewport displaying so let's just reset that i don't know why that's erroring okay oh and maybe like this this is quite broad and if you look at it they're overlapping so maybe we should maybe we should take our point radius scale down just copy this one here paste it over on this side paste relative references and just take that down and then we'll get maybe a more distinct 
separation between those two fields. Look at those two. We might need to go even more. I don't know if this is, I don't think this is being used now because, um, I don't know, maybe we need to play around with that. Um, yeah, I think starting stacked, John, is uh, is probably probably not the best idea. This might might help, although even at this point, you know, we're not really seeing the particles kind of getting sucked away from each other um, based on that surface tension. So I don't know. Maybe I need to up it. Um, we'll keep keep playing with it. It's very possible that this won't work either. This is just an idea that I kind of had to, to try and separate those things. I can see two little shapes there that look like where my sphere positions sort of were, you know, left and right. I don't know if that's just a coincidence. Let's see. It might be handy to view it out here where, where we're viewing the two blobs. There's our two blobs. It's all lab time, that's right. There's our two blobs. And we'll try we'll try just cranking up the um the surface tension as well so that like if we really push it, let's say, you know, if these stick together a lot more. It's kind of interesting what's going on there though. I wonder at this point what does the what does that look like, that surface field? That looks cool with that rainbow. I'm glad I chose I'm glad I chose the rainbow visualization. Um, yeah, interesting. Why don't we well let's let's first try cranking this up, see if this has any effect. I'll just set it really high. Because if th that is doing something it will be quite crazy. There we go. So that is still having an effect on the surface tension. So this multiplier must be must be being applied after the surface um, field is being created. So here we're basically creating that field and then inside here, that value, um, it's probably, probably in one of these particle calculations. Let's look at external forces. Um, What's this boundary vel thing there? Could you make a tornado simulation? Yes, I could make a tornado simulation. I can definitely, um, I can definitely do that in a in another um, in another version of this stream. Rush back. I could certainly take a look at something like that if you're interested. Um, blend velocities. Let's take a look in here. What's going on here? All sorts of crazy stuff. That's not, uh, not what we need. Do, do, do. Okay, let's take a look at the particle updates. <laughs> you're interested in a tornado, John? Is that what you're yesing to? Yeah, sure. I mean, that, look, there's there's lots of ways to um, you know to approach a tornado, but um, yeah, let's let's do it. Sounds fun. Um, kill droplets. Might be time to search surface pressure. Initialize surface pressure. Match surface pressure. Initialize. That turns it on. Um, let's let's find this try and find this parameter here. So this is called surface tension. So let's let's search that. Oops. Enable surface tension here. Ah, so it's actually doing a ah, I see, I see. Here we go. So it's actually computing the curvature. Ah. So it's computing the curvature of the surface field and outputting that into the surface pressure field. So we can do that as well in here. So maybe this 
maybe this is yeah i seem to remember doing this once in the past and that does ring a bell now so with a vdb when we compute a surface we can do a vdb analysis to do a similar thing calculate curvature so if we have a look at that it's basically going to give us you know when you have a curved surface it's going to give you different values depending on how curved that is the flatter it is the less that value and the more curved it is the more that value will be so here we're getting the curvature of that surface and what it's doing inside the solver is firstly it's creating and i should have looked through this a little bit in more detail first this is just creating the surface pressure field from the surface field and then we're updating the values that are in that surface pressure field with this analysis calculation curvature. And then in here, this gas linear combination node, we're scaling the curvature. And here we're actually adding to it 2000 with combined operation add. So we're actually adding to it that value. There's that surface tension channel, which relates to this. If you hover over it, you can see parameter surface tension. Do you do a full render after? Uh, so we did something like it in class with particles. Yeah, we did do a, um, as part of the course, we do do a little tornado example. Um, we do it with, yeah, we do it with points, turning those points into volumes and then running pyro off of that. Um, do I do a full render after? Uh, as part of the stream, do you mean Rushback? I usually, I try to render stuff out, um, but it's hard, it's hard to do it in, in the stream sometimes because of the time constraints. Um, but you know, I, I do tend to try and do it afterwards and show you the result in the next stream. So here we're adding this 2000 value. That's where the 2000 comes in. So what are we going to do? We're going to try and do the same thing. So that's easy we're just just adding values so we can do that in a volume fop in our setup and that's kind of what i was doing here but i was multiplying so we're going to calculate our curvature we'll keep incoming vdb name that will that will uh store it in surface pressure again so we'll do those two things and hey mitchell how's how's your volcano going are you rendering in Redshift? Um, how how's it? How long is it taking? STF Union. Ah, so expected grid outside value greater than zero got zero. Expected level set grid to the STF Union operation found unknown surface pressure and un. Ah, okay. So these are no longer STFs, even though they look like STFs here. I don't think they actually are. So I'm gonna set this back to add. And I'm going to set the visualization to, yeah, that's fine. Um, and then what we can do here to utilize this same surface tension control, I can copy this channel here, copy parameter. And if we just double check what we were doing, so we were adding surface, surface pressure. We were adding a value to it here of 2000. So let's try and replicate that here. If we add, instead of putting a value there, we'll do channel. Um, we'll just call it like solver add. So now I'm adding this channel called solver add and I click here to create that parameter down below. Now I've got this value, which you can see it's affecting the, it's affecting the field there, 2000. So I can paste relative reference in there now I've got that linked. So I've got that same control that I had here, but now it's linked in here. And I can actually just disconnect this whole business. So this now is no longer calculating it inside the solver. I'm calculating it for it in my own salt solver. Again, who knows what will happen? I'll hit save just in case, just in case I've severely broken this. And we know that 2000 is too strong. So let's go 200. And we're seeing those um, those fields come out now, which is kind of interesting. We can hide that so it doesn't display. 
actually just for a baseline let's go 2000 again make sure that we get some crazy results yeah it doesn't actually look like it's doing that much so let's go 20,000 200,000 let's check the values to make sure that make sure that we're getting values in the correct ranges so yeah we got 20,000 out here we got zero out there let's just wind that back a little bit let's go 200 we got negative we've got negative values uh, I mean we don't have negative values so that that's a bit of a problem I think let's check out one of these before we so here here's some negative values there negative curvature happening negative so maybe our VDB combine is actually I think it's the ad so I'm, I'm not sure how it's working inside here but by this set to add, I would have thought, you know, at the moment, that's what's going on. It's raising all our values to be positive. But it looks like we do still need negative values based on what we originally observed out here. We did have those kind of, um, those negative values and positive values. So let's not do add. I'll do multiply. Oops. Instead, set our view plate back here. See what happens with that. Go 2000 again. And perhaps disconnecting that enable is a bad idea. So I'm going to reconnect that because maybe that um, internally flicks something on somewhere else as well. But I'm going to turn off maybe this stuff here. I'm going to turn that off. And maybe I'll turn off this. Let's see if that helps. Really messing around with the way that the solver works now. So possibly it's gonna do some bad things. Um, uh, also, we're plugging this into particle velocity. I might plug this into volume velocity because it does, it does make a difference where you kind of plug in certain fields. So I've, I've noticed that um, it is better to plug in like when you're doing volume operations to plug them into the volume velocity tab. Um, hey, David, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm mostly better. I've still, still got a touch of this cold virus, whatever it is, hanging around, but um, I am feeling mostly better. How are you going with the bats, David? I, um, I was thinking about talking about that today if you, if you were around. Um, if you're... If you're still working on it, or if you need any need any tips, let me know. Um, Redshift is pretty fast. Thirty seconds of frame. That's that's great, Mitchell. Thirty seconds of frame is awesome. Of course, ten seconds of frame would be better, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think with volumes, you know, you're always going to get slow renders, so you kind of have to just kind of have to just deal with it. Let's 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 bypass this section here and see what's going on. See if we can. Because this doesn't really seem to be doing anything. Maybe I'll put in sourcing, post solve, let's see. I have a feeling it's maybe something to do with how we're how we're calculating this here. Or how we're outputting these values. Better be combined. Maybe we actually need to convert it as well to a Houdini volume. You know, it may not like the fact that it's an STF. Um, so if we do STF to fog for, let's do no change, VDB. Well, what if I convert it to a Houdini volume? Let's try that. Sometimes um, some solvers don't like using VDBs. They might not be correctly configured for using VDBs, so you need to convert them back to Houdini volumes. I don't know. Um, bats are going okay, mostly resorted to a Niagara solution. 
cranking them out in a torus pattern around the camera. Oh, I see. Yeah, cool. Vector fields. Oh, we can talk about vector fields. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I don't know how you would use that. I, I guess you can figure that out in Niagara, but yeah, vector fields are pretty easy to generate. It depends kind of what you need it to do. Um, but like, if you're just talking about like a noisy kind of vector field, that's, that's pretty simple. Um, I can show you how to do that very quickly if you like. So, well, there's some interesting behaviors happening, but I'm not convinced that this is kind of, this is really working yet. So let's crank it up. What am I doing with this value? I'm multiplying. So it should, it should result in just extremely high values if, if indeed it is working, but it doesn't, it does not seem to be. And perhaps, let's just make sure, maybe I'll turn this back on, match surface pressure, initialize surface pressure, and I'll leave the calculation off here. We go all down here, vector pressure. Um, similar to a point case in Houdini, just a way to describe some motion of my particles. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, there, there are lots of ways of doing that sort of thing um, in, in Houdini, but I can, I can definitely kind of show you some, some ways of doing that stuff. So yeah, I, I don't think this is working. It's not, not really not really doing what I what I'd hoped and perhaps perhaps maybe we shouldn't use the VDB combine I don't know if that's kind of messing things up let's just try like doing one of these fields um, and seeing if seeing if that works let's check these values round them so we've got negative values, we've got positive, we've got some positive and negative values that kind of looks similar to what we had previously. Let's look at the volume wrangle after that. Super duper high values. So let's just turn that down. Still really stupidly high. Wow, some crazy, crazy values in there. So I guess yeah, we need to bring this back down to a regular range. There we go. So that maybe maybe is slightly better. Let's take a look and see if one of these will work. I'm sure I'm probably missing something here. That is important, but so far I cannot, I cannot see it. I feel like it's kind of this, this stuff I shouldn't have on, but there may be somewhere else where, where this is being used that I can't, I can't see. I'm going to turn viscosity off for a second and see if, see if it makes it any clearer if that surface tension is, is kind of working. Oh, it's very interesting what's going on there, but surface tension. Mm -hmm. Let's put a convert in, convert it to a Houdini volume. Uh, so that's a Houdini volume. Let's try that. Yeah, I don't know. Might have to abandon this technique. Might take me, might take me a few hours to to figure out what's going on. I'm I'm sure I'm sure I can get it working. I'm sure I'm just missing um, something. You know, something imp important. Um, let me hook it back up to particle forces and, and see if that makes any difference. If I turn that off.
yeah, it just doesn't really seem to be doing anything. Hmm. Well, I might have to abandon this for now because I don't want to bore you with me trying to figure this out for hours. Um, I, I'm sure that this will work eventually. I just, you know, maybe I'm just not creating it exactly right. Uh, I need to kind of investigate maybe more what these what these fields are. I think I think these must be um, Houdini volumes. So perhaps perhaps not using the VDBs you know, is, is a better way to do it. Although the analysis stuff, I'm not entirely sure. Um, actually, one thing, you know, we have these groups and we do have the ability to kind of, um, you know, put some groups in occasionally somewhere. Like there, there are these group fields. So we could potentially like try and create these per group. Um, I don't know. Not sure. Not sure what the best idea is. I'm gonna have to gonna have to think about it for a minute i mean this this section is definitely working in terms of it's creating a field but it's just not not being those values are not being applied um so that's a bit a bit unfortunate um yeah i don't know anyway i mean this is you know this is all part of it it's all part of the process of trying to figure out these kind of complex things um i'm sure yeah, I'm sure we can figure it out eventually. Let's let's just have a quick look, and we can use it in here. Um, David, uh, like to create a um, a vector field. I mean, there's there's different ways of thinking about it, but you could, you know, you've got my um, my lava lamp here. If I make a box that is the size of this lava lamp, basically. In Houdini, I can just turn this into, um, what am I going to do? I'm going to turn this into a volume. So I'm going to do VDB from polygons. But I'm also going to just, actually, what should I do? Yeah, I'm going to add velocity to this. So I'm going to add uh, an attribute wrangle here. And I'm going to say V at V equals 0, 1, 0. So I'm just giving this an up vector at the moment. I can turn this into a VDB and then surface attributes. I'm going to do point V and just call it VEL. Turn off the, surf, the surface field and now I've got this velocity field here. If I put a volume velocity node down, I can add things like curl noise to it. So what I'll do is I'll put a, um, a what is it, volume trail node. This one takes velocity volumes as an input, so bell, and it takes points as a visualizer input. So points from volume, like this, and then we should be able to see there's our there's our up vector. So you can kind of see that there. You can actually see that it's sort of it's limited to the surface. So if I if I take that down. Oh, it actually doesn't seem to have made a difference. Maybe just the trail length. Uh, it is everywhere, but you can kind of see that it's... There's a little bit missing inside. You can kind of see that shape. You can sort of see there's a bit of a void inside. So I think... Let's turn fill interior on. There we go. You can see that fills it now. And then volume velocity, add curl noise. You can see that that creates a field of noise essentially and you could run particles through that so you could export that as a velocity field you can see here I've got a velocity field it's a vector 3 you could bring that in to you know something or you could use it inside um, Houdini you've got a pop network you could let me just uh, create a sphere here and get some particles off of and then I'll bring this in Oh, cool. So you could also do this as part of, like points as well, rather than a volume. Because um, when you say point caches, that makes me think that it's not volumes. But um, oh, I just I just noticed I'm frozen. Um, I'm gonna switch to camera two. Oh, look at that. The quality is not so good, but at least I'm not frozen anymore. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. 
maybe maybe it's just the terminology that you're using um point caches but but yeah does it support volumes or is it just sort of point based stuff with velocity um and vector information um so what am i going to do here i've got my little simulation yeah yeah you should if, if my camera freezes let me know i'm going to turn my light down it's a bit intense um i don't know why i don't know why it freezes i've tried a few different like capture interfaces and it's still still freezing um so what was i gonna say ah so i've, I've got some particles right if i add some velocity to these i can get them shooting upwards you know whatever but i'm going to use a pop advect by volumes and this is going to bring in yeah right so there might be points but i can show you i can show you something like that um so here is where i would bring in that velocity field so i'm plugging it into the second context here so i can just go second context geometry turn on the guide so i can see it and you can see i've got my little display there so i won't have any particle velocity so that these without this do nothing so that we can see what this is doing if i hit play you can see now this volume is advecting these particles essentially and when they get out of where that volume is you know we've only got this box they're just going to kind of continue on in their their motion so they'll just keep spreading out based on what they had received when they were inside the volume so that is going to advect those kind of like a fluid you know this is the way that flip works essentially is that you create this velocity field every frame and it moves the particles around and that's why flip particles move together more than pop particles do because you have this velocity field so this is exactly the same way that flip works essentially except that velocity field is being dynamically calculated every frame so if you wanted to do this with just particles instead or points if that's all you can deal with you could do something like this where you calculate points from volume to get a field of points and then instead of using volume velocity you could use point velocity and that has very similar options add curl noise let's just create a velocity marker like this so let's scale it down so we can see it so you can see i get very similar result the curl noise calculations are the same pretty much um, so you could use this if we plug that into the pop net it's going to be different because we're not dealing with a velocity field now we're dealing with point field but we can um let's let's see i'll put a sop solver down you know good good old-fashioned sop solver let's plug that in the line and i'm going to object merge in that point velocity node oh, need to go out one more so there's my point field and i can actually just attribute transfer from to the velocity from that field to these points and i can do it based like on a uh, blend width so i could just do a little bit or i could do it a lot and you can increase the sample count to make that a bit a bit kind of uh, better less a bit more blurry i guess but if i hit play on this you'll see it's a different result so i need to play with the values a little bit and this this velocity field actually i cranked that value down so it's pretty low let's turn that there you go see that so you could do something like that as well where you're transferring velocities from one point cloud or point you know kind of point object to another i don't know if you can do that um in niagara is that what, niagara that's what it's called um but you know you could try something like that this is also a velocity field you know you could generate a particle simulation to drive another simulation um so you know this is a bunch of points with velocities on it so if you have a look at that that is now a velocity field that you could read into another simulation if you wanted to so lots of options you know for doing that sort of stuff 
um, the velocity field option is great and the velocity like using the oh cool well maybe you can bring in a velocity field then if you can um, if you have that ability in Niagara then maybe you could bring in a velocity field and use that the cool thing with you know being able to use velocity fields is that you can basically sculpt a velocity so it gives you that ability to you know let's say you want things to travel along a path or a torus or something um, it gives you that ability to to sculpt something so for instance if we had a curve oops um, just a curve and I drew something just template my source here let's just draw something in top view I mean in in um, in pops you have the pop curve force so you don't necessarily need to do what I'm about to do but you know let's say that you didn't have that you could try and do something else so there's our there's our little curve right and I might just um, I might just pick that end point there and move it up I'm gonna move that up. Oh, actually I I want, a, I want an edit mode to move that. Thought that was going to give me one, but, but doesn't look like it. So the edit node set to soft radius. I'll crank that up. That allows me to get a little spring motion. I thought I would have to change something in terms of the fall off there, but that, that actually worked really well. Nice. So from this, uh, yeah, John, you could sculpt some stuff. As well. Oh, you mean you're questioning what I mean by sculpt? Uh, well, sculpt as in you can, you can make, um, you know, kind of whatever you like in terms of, you can really sculpt. I guess you know to me just means you can make whatever you whatever you like. You can, you can sculpt it into into forms or you know make all sorts of interesting shapes. So. In pops, you can just use a curve force, a curve like this in a pop curve force, which is really cool. So pop curve force. I fed that into the fourth context, I think. There it is. And this has lots of controls for like the radius, follow, suction, orbit. So if I hit play on this, you'll see these are going to follow this. They are allowed to go outside. So if I increase the radius, maybe increase the follow scale and air resistance um, you can see there we go so high air resistance is really what you need to get it to stick but you can see I can I can get these sort of to flow perfectly along that curve well it looks like we've got a little crossover happening there where it's getting sucked through so that's a really easy way to use curve forces but let's say you didn't have that ability you could um, you could use something like this. So what I'm going to do is create a vector that runs along the curve. And the easiest way to do that is just to use a polyframe node to create a bitangent velocity uh, vector. So let's just set that to N so we can view it. Oh, actually, it's tangent. Whoops, not B, N. So you can see that that is a vector now that runs along the surface of the curve. So I can turn that into velocity using an attribute angle. So I can say V at V equals V at N. And now I've visualized velocity. It's actually running the opposite direction of what I want. It's going backwards. So I could multiply that by negative one to invert it. And now it's running, oops. Now it's running along the length of the curve. So that's cool. And now we could turn that into a volume. So let's go, um, we could use, we could use lots of things here. So we could do VDB from particles to generate VDB from those points. And you'll see that puts a sphere of VDBs around each point. Probably need to resample this curve. Um, well, tornadoes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you definitely could use, um, a volume that you've created from a curve like a helix or created from some other method maybe a particle sim generating that original velocity and then use that to drive a pyro sim or yeah some other sort of simulation you could definitely do
do this technique for, for generating tornadoes. Uh, so you can see with that resample in there, I get a much better sampling of points. You can see that generates a ton of points. It also smooths out the curve a little bit sometimes. Um, you can see, so yeah, it just sort of helps with some of those junctions. Pyro, that's right. So smooth will also help that a little bit. Just make that a bit nicer. Polyframe, velocity, and VDB. So we don't really want the surface VDB, but that can be useful for certain things. So we might leave it there. And then I'm going to put point attributes one, V, VDB name, vel, vector type. I don't know if it's necessary to choose this, but I always set that to velocity. And then let's plug that into this input, second input instead. Get rid of that pop curve force. Turn on that pop advect again and let's see what happens. There goes our particles. And you can see they're kind of they're exiting, so we need to we need to crank up the air resistance, I think. Air resistance is basically like a drag, but it helps it helps those particles follow that field more. So you can see we've essentially created um, the same effect, but with you know, creating that ourselves. So th there's lots of different ways of kind of setting this. It looks like it's kind of getting a little bit stuck there as well. I don't know what, I don't know why, I don't know why that might be getting stuck. So let's have a look. Possibly the particles are just exiting and they can't get back out. So we can control the radius as well. So we can inflate that if we want. Oh, look at that. Looks like maybe they maybe they're not getting captured or something. Uh, would setting the original curve to NURBS? No, but yeah, I mean, you could set the curve to NURBS. Uh, it will probably affect our edit, maybe. But I could always convert it to NURBS afterwards. Um, the only thing is that it has to end up being points anyway, because this whole workflow from like here down is working on points. So you would need to, uh, we don't want to be NURBS surface, NURBS curve. You would need to still convert it back to points and, and smooth it at some point because, whoops, oh dear, I hate it when I click on that. Um, because you still need to generate these normals. So yeah, it look, uh, looks like it's still working. I guess the resample in there. The resample is probably going to convert it to a from a NURBS curve. So you can see here it's a NURBS curve, but after the resample, it converts it to a polygon anyway. So yeah, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, polywire, what, um, what do you mean by polywire? Oh, look, here's, here's one issue here. Our volume is not full, so we need to turn on that again. Forgot about that one. Fill. Oh, we don't have fill interior. Hmm. What are we going to do here? Let's see. What could we do? Half band voxels. Can we increase? Oh, we can increase. Maybe we could do that. Let's let's visualize this so we can see what we've, we've got going on here. So velocity, volume. Um, I'm going to do a points from volume here off of our... Hopefully that'll work. Let's see. Oh, no. Okay, so you know what I'm going to do here? I am going to use a polywire here to create a surface that I can fill with points and then plug that into my volume trail so that I can visualize this velocity field. And yeah, there we go. The velocity field is kind of everywhere, which is good. Let's just... Yeah, so I think this half band voxel set to three was giving me a like... Maybe no volume inside. I don't know. Maybe not. No, it looks looks okay. Where does my sphere live? Uh, maybe it sort of lives a little bit just outside where that trail, where that line is. Let me move that inside a little bit more. Let's see if that has any any effect. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's weird. I think yeah, what's going on here is that it's shooting outside. So I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to put a pop drag on, see if that helps. Just rain things in a little bit. 
Ah, there we go. Got a little bit further. Let's increase the air resistance. Beautiful. So the drag really helps because if it shoots outside this, oh, that's really nice. If it shoots outside this volume, it's gonna just stop essentially. And that's what was happening at the start there. It was going outside and they're just kind of, they're just kind of stopping. So uh, upping the drag seems to really help that. And then we've got this set to just update velocity at the moment. So we can just, we can blend more or less of that original velocity in. So I think if we set that to zero, it does nothing. Set it to one or higher, we can't go higher, okay. So let's just up the velocity scale and that should make it go a bit faster. There we go. So we've created our own velocity volume in the shape of a curve. You don't have to use pop advec by volumes either. If you know you you're interested, you can dive inside and learn how this is done. This is a big spider web of stuff, but really, this is the only thing that that you need to worry about. It's that advec by volumes. So you can see this takes a position, which is the particle position, and it takes the name of the field which is velocity. So let's create one. Pop vop. Uh, advect by volumes. And we take the sample position and we take the file name from op input one. Oh, actually op input two. The primitive name is velocity, that's correct. Time step is time increment. Advect method, single step, that's fine. CFL, that's fine. Um, and we're gonna go out here to our pop pop under inputs, input two. I'm going to just point this, or actually I can choose second context, which is where our field is going in. There's our velocity field coming into the second context. And then we've got this advected position, but we need, that's the, the moved position. We need to add that to our original position think let's let's try uh oh maybe not let's, let's have a look effective position let's go back to the start oh there we go no we don't need to add it so there you go it's basically created the same thing and i don't have any controls at the moment so i would need to need to kind of work that out um so i think to speed it up, we could just basically increase the time increment. So let's put a multiplier on there. Because it's basically going to advance faster if we up the time increment. So if we say, here's our little parameter we promoted, put a two down, and then it's going to go twice as fast. We put a five down. And there you go, you can see now it's going too fast for the amount of substeps. essentially. We could increase those substeps, and hopefully that would improve the result. Maybe not necessarily. Oh yeah, there we go. So three substeps. that looks a little better. But so just by multiplying up the time increment, we can speed this up or down. Um, so I like doing this when I've got an vector by volumes that I want to do and I just want it to be simple because sometimes it's a little bit hard to dial it in with the pop advec but this is very easy to control and it also means that you can we've got age on these particles right so you know if I set my age to let's say three so they'll die at some point there we go they're dying right at the end which is good I've got my age and life here. If I divide those two together, so divide age by life, I get a value between zero and one. And then I could multiply my advec by volumes by a normalized age so that they get stronger the further they get towards one. And I could run that through a ramp or a fit. So let's run that through a ramp parameter and a spline ramp. And now I can control this. So I could say, actually, they're gonna be fast at the start and slow towards the end. And I could change that. 
minutes so I can get them to slow down much earlier. And I can have their age be a bit longer. Or some of them can be, there can be some variance as well. So you can see I'm getting them slowing right down. And I don't have to have that to zero. I could you know, sort of ease it right off like that. Or I could do it the other way. So I could have them speed up, slow down. So you can't do this really with the pop and vec by volumes. You do have the ability to add vex expressions in here, but I, f I find you know being able to do this and kind of make my own advec tool basically you know gives me a much greater kind of option um, to you know to be able to do things. The other cool thing that you can do with this is um, you know we have this surface field. Hey, no worries, John. Catch you later. See you in see you in Slack. Um, we've got this surface field that we created here and that gives us the ability to detect if particles are inside or outside of the surface because as we talked about earlier with um, with flip uh, surface is an SDF field which means sign distance so it gives you a distance of whether it's inside or outside of the volume so if we run you can do it in here you can do it in VEX it's a little bit easier to do in VEX actually but um, so I mean, I may as well. We can do this where, and we probably, I don't know if we have an advect by volumes in vex. Let's have a look. I haven't, um, what am I doing? Pop wrangle. I haven't done any vex before. Let's see, advect uh, volume. Uh, I guess maybe we need to assemble it ourselves by calculating that velocity and then adding it to V. I don't know might be a bit harder to do in VEX. Um, but we have this easy ability to do volume sample. So volume sample, and then we just need to feed it a geometry path, a primitive, a volume name, and a vector position. So the geometry path would be pointing to an input here. And just like we did here, we can point it to the second context geometry. So we can say inputs, input two. You don't want to use input one because input one is the node itself. So we always start from input two and we can do input two, second context. So we can say volume sample one is input two. Surface. And we need a position and that would just be the position of the particles. So basically returns the value of the surface where that particle is. So that particle will sample the value that's on the surface field and retain it. So I'm just going to say um, at surface equals. And that will then store a value on these particles. If we have a look at the spreadsheet, uh, that's a flip spreadsheet. Let's look at pop object geometry. We should have on here, we'll hide all. There's a surface value. So you can see negative and positive values. So these ones are inside the surface and these ones are outside. And we can color those. So we could say if at surface is greater than zero, which means it's going to be outside the surface or right on the surface as well. Let's color these red so that we know if any particles, and let's just make sure our particles, what color they are. Uh, I think that they should just be black. Let, let's just color this black. There we go. Ah, and there's our red particles showing up. So you can actually see the red ones are, yeah, probably just lying right on the surface. And then all the black ones are inside. You can see it clearly here where you've got this ring of red ones. And then you can see those black ones running inside here as well. So what you could do with the... Um, with the with that with that value these these positive and negative values is you could use them to do certain things you know you could use them to push them inside or outside of the surface if you wanted to so you could say like um, I don't know what what would I what would I do um, if at surface is greater than zero what could we do we could um, we want to do here. I mean, we could just we could just drag them as well. So we could say like at v at v times equals 
0 0.5 so that those ones slow down. Let's see what happens with that. So you can see those redder ones are sort of slowing down a little more. So we can, this is like multiplying down velocity is essentially just going to create a type of drag effect. So the, the more we multiply it down, the, the much slower it is going to be. Although we've got two things that are fighting against the velocity here. So we've got this, which is cranking up our velocity quite a lot. And then let's put this after the pop block. Let's see if that makes any difference. So what we should see is some of those black ones should actually move a bit faster. Dv times equals, let's, let's times equals zero. These two things I think are, are definitely fighting against each other at this point. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you could also do like, you know, you could just set a vector as well, like, or, or set force. You could say like V at force equals zero comma negative 9.8 oops negative 9.8 comma zero something like that let's see what happens there there we go ah look at that that's kind of cool so you've got red ones that are falling down under gravity now and the black ones are continuing because they're inside the surface and of course if you shift this value you know if you said less than rather than greater than that would do the black ones because they're the ones that are oh look that's kind of interesting i guess maybe oh actually now it's changed yeah it's changed what's colored so the what was previously the black ones are now red so we've inverted that because we're coloring whatever this is returning so you can see they're they're kind of falling down and interesting that they're stopping as well those ones not sure why not sure why they're stopping like that it's kind of weird whereas the other ones weren't who knows who knows um so yeah it you know being able to grab a volume in here like this is is really handy and you can create some really sort of customized effects that way as well um volume sample is great you know just for detecting when things are inside volumes it's really really handy you can use that as as like something to trigger some effect as well so if you like created a sphere up here for example something like this just did a vdb from it so let's just do vdb from polygons here and let's just plug this into fourth input and we'll change this this proper angle here to grab the fourth input, oh actually, second input on the pop angle, fourth input on the dot geometry. Let's see what happens. Oops, so let's check our code. Greater than zero, so we're gonna do less than zero. So if it's inside, it's gonna fall down. So we should still get our pop, vop, moving everything via that curve. And then when they go inside, hopefully they will. Oh, there we go, look at that. See, they're starting to go inside that um, inside that sphere. In fact, if we turn off the force, we can see that a bit clearer. Maybe because we put this before or after the pop block. Maybe that's why the falling isn't working now. I'm not sure. But let's see. This will be a bit clearer. Now we can just see when those points pass through that volume, they'll go red. And if we increase the life, they should go back to being black once they exit. Or we might need to put another if statement in there to send them back to black after they pass through. Yeah, so it looks like they're, they're staying red. So what we could do is, um, we could say like, if, uh, let, let's just, we'll just put an at cd equals zero first. And we'll see if that reverts them back to black once they pass through. Yeah, there we go. So now we can clearly see where that volume is of the, of the sphere, which is cool. 
Um, so that's that's really handy, you know, if you want to do any kind of, I don't know, event-based stuff or, or stuff that is meant to happen in a particular area. Um, it's really handy to use that volume sample to detect, you know, where that stuff is going to happen. And you can actually see now, because I'm reverting them back to black, they're getting sucked back in. I've created a kind of loop where they're getting sucked back into the original volume. So that's kind of cool because I put that original um, black back in there. Oh, uh, actually, yeah, I don't know. The black doesn't actually matter. It's just visualizer, but they are actually getting sucked back into that original velocity and coming back around, which is kind of cool. Um, but you can see these particles that lie outside. They're kind of, they're sort of just raining down and not getting affected by anything as well so you could also yeah put in like an additional if statement in here saying like if it is greater than zero then i don't know do something maybe kill them or um yeah put a put a force or put a velocity that shoots them off or, or even create a group or something even just changing the color like so that we can see those ones that are outside um and we may just need to adjust that to be beyond zero so that we can really see the ones that are just outside or just on the edge. Looks like we've got very small threshold here of, of what is inside and what is outside that field. I think, I think that is because, um, oh, actually, no, it should be, should be based on, ah, uh, you know what? I was thinking that it was going to be based on the curve. That's what I was imagining, but actually we're based on that sphere. So maybe we need to do another volume sample based on a different input so that we can do both, you know, um, the sphere surface and the curve surface. So that's, that's why it's showing up all green because it's using the curve to determine that uh, it's not using the curve. It's using the sphere to determine that. So anyway, lots of lots of cool things you can do with this. Basically, you know, you don't have to be restricted by the pop advet um, by volumes. It's just not, you know, it's not necessary. Um, although I use it all the time, but when I want to do something more complicated than that, then it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of, you know, you just you can do it yourself with a pop plot very easily. Um, so I hope hopefully that that's helpful. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to persist with this, you know, flip problem um, and see if I can figure it out. And I'll, I'll let you guys know next week if I, if I manage to find... <laughs> you just noticed, Audrey. Yeah, my other, my other camera is, is frozen. I'm just, just not there. I don't know why it, why it happens, but I can't do anything about it. Um, and this one is a weird kind of bright version as well. Um, yeah, so I, I am going to try and solve this problem and see if I can get it working. The surface tension is currently not working. The two blob groups are working well. Like that's kind of giving me a nice ability to mesh things separately and keep them separate in the meshing stage. Uh, but I want to kind of I want it to kind of do that in the solver stage as well, so that we we get separation in the in the simulation as well. Because if we look at the full result, we've got this happening at the moment. So we've got these two blobs inside of this other much larger kind of space, and we want to mesh this as well. Um, which which of course we can. Um, we could blast this one and this one away and then we get the rest and then we could multiply that uh sorry um mesh that you can see there's two little holes there and merge that as well of course of course we can do that and that's kind of cool you know you do get this separation now between these two things if the resolution was greater that that sort of would be a little better um maybe we can take what can we take down let's take down like the droplet scale and maybe the voxel scale might help as well 
um, and you can see, you know, now we get this nice separation between those blobs. But then when we go a little bit further into our simulation, as they rise up and start to swirl around a little bit, then it starts to kind of, it all gets a bit mixed up. And that's what I would like to, I would like to avoid. I just had a crazy idea, which I think is a little bit too insane, but you could potentially like solve each blob separately and then bring that blob into the simulation of the next one as a collider so that it always kind of bounced off that other blob. Um, you could do it. It would be ridiculous to do that. Um, but, you know, sometimes. Sometimes the ridiculous thing is, is the fastest way to get there rather than trying to mess around with, um, you know, with all these different solver hacking things that, you know, that you can do. Um, it may be faster for me to just simulate things separately, so simulate separate blobs and then, and then hook them all back together. Um, I'll try it. I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll, pl I'll play around with a few different options and see. Um, and we can... We can talk about it next week. Talk about talk about what I got, the results. I mean, this this does kind of work, but but it's not. Yeah, it's definitely not perfect. Um, so yeah, we're kind of out of time. Got got a couple more minutes. I'm just gonna just gonna keep playing this through and see see kind of what it's behaving like. Um, or maybe I'll maybe I'll go back in here and turn these things back on that I turned off and just see what happens when I. When I just crank the surface tension, I think this will this will definitely explode with such high surface tension values. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Let's just call it done. Dust my hands and uh, and say it's done. Um, it's the curse. The curse of being being an artist. Never happy. Never happy with what you've created. Um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm definitely mostly happy with the rising and the falling effect that we created last week. Um, but just, just that, that blobbiness. And I, I said it last week, it, I, I thought it would be really hard to do. Um, I'm just not sure. Yeah. Not sure what the best, what the best approach is, but because this is Houdini, you know, we can, we can get there. We just need to try and figure out figure out how to do it, what to, what to, what to manipulate and what to change. Um, really high surface tension values. Yeah. It seemed to just create all kinds of weirdness with flip. So, Hey, no worries. Rush back. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Um, stay tuned next week and we'll, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what, you know, what we can, what we can get up to. And if anyone has anything that they would like me to look at, then, um, please, please put it in the comments or something. And, you know, I, I'm always trying to come up with interesting projects, but I just sort of make these things up. So if there's anything that you're kind of interested in, maybe the tornado, that's a good one. Actually, we can, um, we can start looking at a tornado next week. Um, that, that might be a really cool project to work on over a few weeks. Um, oh, there we go. Look at that. Nice blob that we're getting. Perfect sphere. That's kind of cool. A little bit higher surface tension. Maybe a Geostorm. The whole Geostorm movie. Let's just do that. I don't know if you saw <laughs> if you saw that. They, they were working on that when I was at Dean Egg. Um, a few years ago. Fire Tornado. Oh, yeah. Why not? Well, if we create a tornado, we can easily turn it into a fire tornado. Oh, mm, yeah. More or less. Let's create a tornado first, and then, and then we'll see if we can... If we can. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Let's create a B-movie in six weeks. Um... <laughs> now you're talking, Audrey. Sharknado, that's right. Let's get some chainsaws in there. Step one, create the tornado. Step two, add sharks. 
step three profit we could definitely we could definitely do that i mean you know once we create the tornado you can kind of add whatever you like to it and and just like i showed you with the advection stuff like you can you can advect whatever you like in there um that's right i'd pay to see that i don't know if anybody's seen birdemic but that have a look at the trailer for birdemic that that is a classic uh, classic movie um Oh, this is pretty cool. Surface tension at 50 seems to work quite well. Um, yeah, it's not too bad. <laughs> That's right. Should put a put a Bitcoin donation link in my in my description. And fund my fund my Sharknado inspired B movie. Um yeah, that's, that's not too bad. But yeah, still, I want to be able to control those blobs, so... I don't know. We'll see. I'll keep working on it a little bit. Let you guys know what I what I got to. Oh, yeah, there you go. You can see those two blobs mixing still. Who knows? Who knows? Can't always, can't always figure it out in Houdini. Sometimes it takes a few days to, to get to the bottom of a really complex problem. But uh, thank you for thank you for joining me and enduring my uh, my trying to figure it out. Um, well, it's twelve o'clock here. Thank you for joining me, everybody. I'm going to uh, going to go and try and figure this out and work on some other cool things. But um, I'll definitely definitely work on a tornado next week. I think that that could be a really cool cool thing to uh, lots lots of stuff to talk about with that. You know, pyro vection, particles, destruction potentially fire sharks you know the works um so yeah thanks thanks for joining me everybody and uh i'll see you again next week if you're around have a good week